Hi, I'm Jerry Ford and welcome to my Thursday night mini class. What are we going to do tonight? Tonight we're going to talk about the basics of paper piecing, also known as foundation uh, piecing as well. These are so much fun to do. Um, they're almost like when we were learning to sew as children, we would, our moms would give us little pictures that on a, on a piece of paper and we'd sew on our sewing machine with them. Well, this is a lot like this. Why I like foundation piecing is because you can get these very, very sharp, sharp angles. See these really sharp angles right here? You can't get sharp angles like that with standard piecing, or at least I can't. Nothing, nothing ever matches, and look how nice these are in the corner. Everything, every little point is just perfect. I'm sure there are some people who are that gifted. I'm not. <laughs> so I, it's actually one of the first quilts that I learned to do was foundation piecing because it was so much fun and it was like a lot like playing with uh, with my toy sewing machine when I was a child. Here's a couple of sources that I have. Um, I like this book which is Foundation Piecer and there was a magazine out years and years ago called Foundation Piecing Magazine and it was on in uh, I guess the early 2000s. It was a very nice uh, in fact, I have most of them, most of those old magazines, because I really like the technique. It's got a lot of variety. It's, it, this one is by Liz Schwartz and uh, Stephen Seifert. These books are no longer in publication, but you can find these like pretty much everywhere. Amazon, eBay, Thrift Books, Alibris, they all have them. But see, you've got quite a bit of variety. You can get pictures. And some of these patterns are quite, quite complex. Like here's a rose, um, birds. Look, here's even a, an angel. I mean, it's endless. Look, you can see the number of things that they have in here. Another book that I really like is done by Carol Doak, who happens to be the queen of foundation piecing, which is 300 quilt blocks, paper piece quilt blocks. If you put in your search engine free paper piece patterns, I guarantee you you'll find hundreds of these patterns. So like there's little houses, um, trucks, you name it. See how it put all of these together? These are just so cute. And they're endless. Like these are four blocks put together. Some of them are complex blocks. Some are simple. And we're going to actually do one from out of this book today. So I can show you the basic technique, but look at these sharp points. You can't do that any other way. What I like about doing paper piecing is you can, like this is virtually done out of scraps. Anytime I have a, a you know, a bag full of, of blue scraps, I break out the patterns and, and I start adding to this. This will eventually be a full size quilt. Here's what the front looks like. Here's what they look like on the back. And then when it's all done and I remove the paper, it looks like any standard quilt that you pieced it together. But it's so much easier this way. Um, okay, here's here's some other couple ones I want to show you. These are my, these are mine. Um, this first one is uh, actually this is one of my first winning quilts. The show quilts. It's a little small quilt. It's only about eight by ten. It's very small. I call it Hummingbird Garden. It's a combination of both paper piecing and that Hummingbird is from the Foundation Piecer magazine back in, I think, 2004. I'd have to look it up to see when. And that one's actually designed by the Hummingbird, at least, not the rest of it, was designed by Lou Schwartz and Stephen Seifert. There was a mag magazine out in the early 2000s called uh, Miniature Quilt Magazine, and they used to have a competition every year called Miniatures with a Heart, and this one happened to have won first place that one year in its category. And the prize for the, the first prize was actually every single ruler and, and grid and cutter that, uh, that uh, uh, Ulfa put out, so I have like the whole collection of, of what was available in about 2003. Okay, the next one here is uh, is also, I think this one is a Carol Doak, 
And this one actually was a, uh, I think, honorable mention winner in the Hoffman Challenge in about 2007, I believe. 2006, 2007. And that's a snail's trail box. And that was done with paper piecing. I love this one. It's by a guy called George Siciliano. And he's out of Pennsylvania, and I took a class workshop with him, and he was amazing. This guy was a big, burly Marine, and here he was doing these tiny little pieces. And this is called Glow in the Dark. It was from 2007 when I went to, on this workshop. And that thing has got over 700 pieces, and it's only about 18 inches by 18 inches. It's very, very tiny, tiny little pieces. Um, is why I really enjoy his stuff. Here's another one that I'm going to be working on. It's called Inter Interstellar Suite. And this pattern's still available. This is what the master pattern looks like here. And um, he has this stuff called foundation stuff. And I bought it. And it's actually just water-soluble stabilizer. It's a little stiffer than normal water soluble. Also, you don't want to use this for stabilizer for your embroidery machine because when you look at it, it obviously has a grain. So here's what here's what the pattern looks like. And it's tiny. I mean, it only measures about uh, maybe eight inches by eight inches finished. It's really little, and it's got little tiny pieces here. I'm planning on making this one. And I also bought a whole package of 50 sheets of that 8.5 by 11 that actually can go through your printer. Um, the only thing I don't like about doing an inkjet printer is printing them is because if you happen to hit this with your iron, the, uh, the uh, ink transfers to your, your ironing board and your iron and anything else you're pressing on. And it does make a mess. Most of the time when I do foundation piece, paper piecing, I will use regular bond paper. You don't buy the heavy stuff. You want the cheapest stuff you can get your hands on. I would take my crayons and I would color in how I want it to look. You know, just, I would just take it and, and, and just start, well, you know, let's not do this one because I'm going to actually use this pattern, so I don't want to mess it up right now. But let's find a more simpler pattern to start with. Let's do this one here. See, here's what theirs looks like. Here's the one we're going to do. I could take this in my printer and enlarge this or make it smaller. Uh, Carol Dokes also came with a, um, with a CD that I can't seem to locate anymore, <laughs> but I have it somewhere uh, that you can use to size it and make it bigger and smaller as you like. This is what the pattern normally looks like, and they're usually numbered in the order that they're stitched in. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. If you don't have to worry about sewing on grain with paper piecing. As long as you're gonna quilt it and quilt it fairly tightly, you don't have to worry about whether it's on grain or not. But if you're one of these people who do, do care about grain, sort of draw it in. Okay, draw in a few pieces. If you want to, you can do, put it on all of them, you know. Okay. I could color code these by just simply putting in some color so that you don't accidentally get the wrong one. <laughs> so, so I'll do this one in green, this still do in green. Uh, this is probably, I'll do a different green and a different green. And then I'll leave those white because those are background color. I don't have to color those in. Other things that you need are uh, actually things that help. Okay, uh, You need to just have a regular size 11, 12 universal needle. It doesn't even have to be a special needle. And realize that you cannot use this needle again afterwards for other regular sewing because paper is going to tear up your needles. So usually what I do is I have, when I'm working on a project, I will stick, when I'm done for the day, I will take the needle off and attach it to my pattern so that I know to put it back on until it starts really making a mess. You need to have, a, it, one thing that helps is what they call an add a quarter ruler. And here's the smaller one. I like the smaller one. And yeah, this is what happens when you drop your clover iron on it. 
most of the time I do not use an iron until I'm all done with the block. So, so anyway, what it does is it has a lip here that makes it easier to do any trimming. You don't have to use these. You can just simply cut it, which is mostly what I do after a while. I'll use this for a little bit, and then I'll go on to using uh, just scissors. I like to have a little thin piece of plastic or a ruler so that I can start to perforate my pieces. Another thing you might want to have in order to score and take the paper off is a seam ripper, and we're not going to use it like you think. Also, if you make a mistake, it helps to have some cellophane tape. The not the shiny kind, but the the uh, the one that has a matte finish will be fine. And of course, it helps to have a little rotary cutter and and a rotary cutting mat. So here's what the individual uh, pineapple pattern looks like. And so here's one all finished and trimmed up. This one just needs to be trimmed, and then I'll show you how to put these together. Another thing I really like to do paper piecing is doing flying geese corners, and these are wonderful. They're all these points are super perfect. You can't go wrong. And then here's what this pattern looks like. And this one I believe I drew myself because I can see my own drawing. So I made it as long as I needed it for the, to match the block. And that way I can just keep making more of them. So see this one? I wanted it to match the block, the finished block, which is how I drew it. So I drew this one myself. Next week we will have our Thursday night class. I'll show you how to draw your own paper piece pattern. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead to the sewing machine and we're going to start working on this flower. Okay, let's take a look at this pattern piece. So we want to look at it. I have piece number one, which I'm going to do in this pink. Um, and then I'm going to concentrate just on this piece and on this piece. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to take my straight edge and I want to literally crease all these lines. Every single line. I want to put a crease in. Why? Because it makes it easier for me to place these little pieces of fabric. So the first thing I do is I crease all of these lines. Okay, so you can see the impressions on the back. So I know this is my piece number one. If I am conscious of the grain, which I look over here, up and down, I can actually just take this and I can see it's covering every single line by a little bit, okay? So usually I will pin it in place from the front just to hold it there for a little bit. And I'm going to fold down the line between one and two. If I'm using my add a quarter ruler, which most of the time I don't, I will use it a couple times, I would take this, I will push the lip up against the paper and I'm cutting my quarter inch. And I can throw that away. Okay. I know my next piece goes here. So if I am conscious of my background piece, Okay, I can do this. <clears throat> Take that. And I and, and sometimes you don't know if that piece is going to fit or not. Here's my outline. I know it has to fit it. So usually what I do is I will make sure it's big enough. And usually I'll take a pair of scissors. And I'm going to cut it extra. Like that. And if I'm still not sure if it's going to fit or not, I'm going to fold this over like about a quarter of an inch and just finger press it down. Okay, so then I can put that on that line. And I know, yeah, that's going to fit. 
it's going to do fine. It's covering all the lines. So then I can feel free to place this right sides together. Okay, place this right sides together like that. If you want to pin it, you can. You don't have to. I've set my stitch to a regular straight stitch center needle position because I'm using a quarter inch foot. Although it's not necessary, you can use your regular straight foot. I want my stitch length to be about one and a half to two millimeters long. And I'm going to start about a quarter of an inch. Here's the line between here and here. I'm going to sew right on the line. So right on the line. And then extend over. You do not back tack. And then just cut. I'm going to fold this over and finger press it down. Okay. If you like, you can just pin it up just to keep it out of your way. Okay, I've got that pinned up. That's fine. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing for this other side. Although most of the time, I don't bother with the, the outer quarter ruler. I will simply, see how that's stitched right here? I'll pull that out of the way, right down to the stitching line. Got a piece of thread caught. <laughs> And I'm going to cut this with my scissors. I just eyeball a quarter of an inch. They also make an eighth, uh, add an eighth, but I also don't use, I just don't use them after a while. Now, once you can keep in your mind what a quarter inch is, you don't really need that. Now we'll go back to another background piece. Okay. If I'm caring about grain, I will pay attention to it. Okay, that looks good. So I think that I can. Usually I do with extra scraps. Just make them extra big because these are from your scrap drawer anyway. Now I would be more conscientious if I were doing this as a, uh, as a uh, you know, big quilt with all the fabric the same. It does use more fabric than a regular pattern. However, I usually don't care. <laughs> I usually will do this out of scraps, so therefore I don't care. Okay. And then I will fold this. And then I know I have to cut this extra here. And I can just leave that pinned. And it looks kind of sloppy right now, but you know, it's, it's okay. It really is okay. And I'm going to pin this out of the way just to keep it from flapping around. Okay, so that was one and two and two, one and three. And then next is my piece number four, which is going to be a green. So I need to get a piece of green between three and four. Here, I'm going to pull this back and cut it. And pull that back here. And then I'm going to trim this a quarter of an inch. And this is probably way overkill here. All right. And then this one doesn't have enough. All right. And again, I'm at this one, I'm not going to care whether I'm on grain or not. So I'm going to simply, I know it's going to come over here. So I know it's got, I usually will overlap by a quarter of an inch. And I'm just going to pull that straight, flip it over, and so start. Here's the line. I'm going to start a quarter of an inch in front of it. And go to the other end. Stitch off. Okay. Reach over and again I'm just going to I've got extra so I know that ends there so I can actually safely just lop this away some more around. Okay. And I'll probably put that, I usually put the pin on the last place I was just to, see now that's, I don't need the pin here anymore because it's already pretty stable. Okay, now I have this one. Now is this piece going to match? Yeah, it is. I think so. So, but the first thing I do is, right here, I'm going to fold this back. 
so that it's felt folded on that line from the right side and lop off the extra. And again, if I'm not sure, I know my, I can see by the fold, here's my piece. So actually I have plenty of room here. Okay, so put this right sides together. Here's the end of it, here it is. Right sides together, flip it over and fill it. And so right on the line. Now say you missed it and you had a problem and it didn't cover or for some reason that you need to take this out, then what I do is I will take my seam ripper and see I, I folded this, uh, it's okay. <laughs> Usually if I flip that over then I will unstitch a little bit of it. But what you do is you just, send, it helps to unpick from this side because you can see it better. If you end up, and then just tape it up, if you tear your paper, just tape it up again and keep stitching. Okay, I'm going to flip this down and finger press it down. Okay, again, I'll move that pin. Okay, we did four and five, so here's number six. So this is the next line that we need to stitch on. So I'm going to... Pull this, I fold on that line that I had pre-folded, okay? This gives me my trim line. Okay. And I know that this next piece, let's see if you can see this, I know that the next piece is here, because I can see it, but I'm just gonna mark it for you. Here is my next piece, okay? It has to cover that much. Okay, um, let's see, I'll take a different green. I don't know if we have room in this one. How about this one? Here's another little scrap. Um, if I care about green, I guess that's okay. That will work. And I just put it right sides together and so. Next one here. Okay. I'll use this little piece. Okay, I'm going to continue. a bit so I am going to stitch it again okay so I had goofed it so I just pulled it pulled the stitching out and I'm back to normal here so now this is all finished and I'm ready to finish clipping it so then I take my out of quarter ruler I'm going to place, just turn it over with the, the lip side up so it gives you a quarter inch line. And just simply trim paper and fabric and everything. I'm just going to put this right here on this line and trim. A quarter of inch away from this last edging. 
And then this is your stitching line for whatever sashing or adding it to another section. All done. Finished. Okay, that turned out really cute. And look at how look at how sharp these points are. Now usually I leave the paper on until I either have an adjoining side on or I'm finished. I just leave that paper right there. Okay, the flying geese piece here is just simply got 12 pieces to it. I sort of trimmed it down a little bit bigger than a quarter of an inch around the outside border. <clears throat> and I need four pieces of blue and eight pieces of various colors of white. Okay, here's my uh, flying geese pattern. Like I said, this is my favorite way of making flying geese because they're always perfect. Okay, I've already done all the creasing and I know that this first piece has to cover that by at least a quarter of an inch. So I'm just going to set this like this and pin it in place. Number two here. scrap and if I'm not sure if it's going to fit I'm going to fold this over right on that line and make sure yeah that's going to cover everything now one problem with paper piecing is that you can't flip these seams to press them towards the dark all of the time so you have to go with the pattern so if you've got like this dark piece and I'm going to overshadow it by a piece of white make sure you go a little more than a quarter of an inch just to cover the line so it won't shadow through. And then start a quarter of an inch away. Overshoot it. I folded this over. See, this piece was a little on the short side, so I folded it over, cut it, and now I can put this. And then when I fold over that quarter of an inch, yes, it fits with plenty of room. So now I can put this right here. And so. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and finish this off camera. And then I'll show you how to join two pieces together. And see, now we start again. So now if you have a little extra here, then you can go ahead and trim it. Normally when I trim this with the scissors, these are paper scissors, okay, is that I will take this and I will just trim it together. I will be back. Okay, I finished this piece of the flying geese and notice how perfect those points are. They can't get better than that. Okay, and then I'm going to give this a good press with a dry iron, make sure there's no steam. And you might want to press on top of a paper towel because the ink from the inkjet printer is going to come out and off on your ironing board. And I usually print, I usually press it from the right side. Okay, now I'm going to trim it up and then we're gonna put, we're gonna add it to this layer here. So we're gonna keep on going. And I'm gonna attach this piece to the end of this one. 
Uh, now what I did here is I knew I was going to have lots of them, so I just really just put them together with tape and just kept on running. But so eventually you're going to have to put two pieces together. Okay, so I'm going to put, I know this has to go this way. Okay, so I'm going to put this right sides together. And I'm going to take pins. I'm going to do my corners. Anywhere you've got an intersection line here. Okay, and I see so you put the pin there. I'm going to put a pin through this side. Do the exact same spot. Do the same thing on the other side. In the corner. And there it's matched into this corner here. Put those pins parallel so that they are perpendicular to the paper like this. Then you're going to take another pin and put it in the direction of the, of the paper for the fabric and just simply pierce through and pin it together right there. Okay. Then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side, making sure that pin is parallel. What I care about is this point. Those points have to match. The more complex your design, the more important those pins need to match. Okay, and then I'm going to take a pin through here. And is it matching right on the line? Yes, it is. Again, leave that parallel or perpendicular. And then take another pin. Anywhere you've got a junction point, you're going to want a needle. Take the pin and match it. Okay, and then you're going to take this to the machine. And I'm going to stitch right on this line from one end to the other. Okay, you're using a small enough stitch length that you don't have to worry about it coming out. And again, don't stitch over your pins. But carefully stitch on those lines. Okay. And see now it's on those lines perfectly. And the point is perfect, so that's good. Now we need to start taking these apart. So I like to use, you can either use your seam ripper, or I like to use my big old T-pins that are really, really firm. And I'm going to stitch, I mean, I'm, I'm going to perforate the paper right at that seam line. Turn it over, do the same thing on the other seam. And then pull out the paper. You don't have to take out every single little piece of paper. Try to get as much out as you can, especially on the seams. Here's a piece here. Don't want to pull your stitching out, though. I usually leave the papers here until I've got everything done. But after a while, and then you, uh, then uh, you you want to you got to take them out because this thing will get too heavy on you. So what I do with like say I have a big section, but I don't want to take out the ends here. I just want to take out the centers until I'm ready to sew this seam right here. Till I'm ready to sew that seam, I don't want to take it out. So usually what I do is I'll take this pin and I will score where I want it to come out. I probably take some. I like to take them out of the points here. Okay, and then you just take out the centers. And you're leaving those ends. Get ready 
here and taking this card out. This can get messy, so get the vacuum cleaner ready. Or this is a good thing to do in front of the TV. Just pull papers out. And again, here, I usually I do is this. And I'll take, I'm just scoring that paper out and then go along the seams here. Works just as well with the seam ripper. In fact, a little easier because you can hold it like a pencil. I'm not going to take it all out, just out of this one section. And this just will make, over time, this will make it lighter. When it's all finished and you're ready to quilt it, that's when I, I usually make sure I take all the paper. I don't have, you don't have to take all these little bits out. That's fine. It'll just go into the batting anyway. That's good. That's all I'll take out for now until I'm done. Okay. And there, that's a little easier to handle. It's more supple where this is kind of stiff. Okay, that's all there is to paper piecing. I hope you enjoyed today's session. I hope you'll go out and try it. Um, try at least once. Uh, next week we're going to talk about how to make your own paper piece patterns with just a ruler and paper and a drawing. Okay, till next week. Bye.